So this week we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, where we left off last week. We're also going to get into, uh, I believe it's the book of Matthew. So, um, you're probably counting. My kids have been counting my words, so we'll see how much I repeat myself today. But uh, Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Now I'm going to stop there. I had intended to go farther, but that's as far as I got with the sermon through the scriptures, so we'll pick up with the rest of that next week. As I got going, that was, as, that was as far as we got. So, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning, Lord, I pray that you would help me to speak clearly and boldly for you this morning. Father, that you would help the hearts listening, Lord, to be softened. To be accepting of your word. Not, not because I am saying it, Lord, but because you are speaking it to their hearts. Father, speak to each one. Be with us in this time, Lord. Help us to be bold. Help us to be strong, Lord. Help us to be comforted, as our scripture earlier said, Lord, that we, because we can lean on you. We praise you in that this morning, Lord. Be with us today as we get into your word. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we find ourselves back in Ephesians chapter 5, and in, I said last week that we find ourselves in, in challenging and... Uh, different circumstances, uncharted territory, if you, if you would, and I, it changed, causes some of us sometimes to want to change course, and I mentioned that last week, but I pondered that more this week again and thought to myself, who am I to say that the Word of God cannot speak for itself in this time? Who am I to pick and choose the favorites of Scripture as if one is better than another? We find ourselves in this chapter, in a place where Paul is talking about following the example of Christ. He's also talking about this morning what is not acceptable for the followers of Christ, the adopted sons and daughters of our Father in Heaven. In this time, which we find ourselves when more people are examining their hearts and rethinking what they do or don't believe about our Savior, how could it not be pertinent to talk about such things? When people are questioning, when people are wondering, that is a time for us to be in the Word of God, to see what the Word of God says, not just to take some pastor's advice, not just to, to, to take some self-help person's advice, but to be in the Word of God. Now, I do sincerely hope that amidst all of these things that we're being inundated with, that we're being kept busy by, that we would dedicate ourselves to being deeper in the Word of God, deeper in prayer, and that we would take a long look at whether or not we have truly been following God, if we have truly been imitators of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These passages are going to cover that and be a good indicator of that for us today. I have to say that since all of this started, I've been more in the Word than I ever have been, more in prayer than I ever have been. And, and that, yeah, that sounds bad coming from me, but it is these times that, that drive us back to the Word of God. And before we get into Ephesians, I want to read quickly from Luke 6, verses 43 and 45, the words of Jesus. The, the heading says, A tree is known by its fruit. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit, for men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. 
for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. That's our title for our message today. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. I want us all to consider this as we go through the scriptures today. Think of, of the things that not only come from our mouth, but that flash through our minds as we listen and watch what's going on around the world. What comes, what flows from our fingers under our keyboards and before we know it is out for the world and out for the Lord to see. What comes in the way of actions, reactions, or, or lack of action. All these come from the heart. And once out cannot be revoked or tucked back away. They are out for the Lord and the world to see. I want to ponder this as we go through the scriptures this morning. Our scripture this morning started in Ephesians chapter 5 with 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, like I said, we covered that last week, and we know that we are to follow God's example, to be imitators of the Lord and Savior, both in word and in deed. We are instructed to do so, and that, that's been our main focus, the fact that these are indeed instructions and not, not simply suggestions for those that don't want to follow the Lord. The scripture continues in verses 3, and se three to 7. But among you there must not be any hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should, they be, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. Verse 3 said, But among you there must be no, not even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Why? Again, because they're improper for God's holy people. Improper how? Because none of these characteristics, none of these lifestyles that we're reading about in these scriptures can be found in Jesus Christ. God did not create us to cling to such things, nor for them to come from our hearts. But because of sin, these are the things that come from our hearts, that come from within. These are the things of which we are to repent before the Lord, the things that, and the lifestyles that are un, unacceptable, but through the blood of Christ have been forgiven. And through the leading of the Spirit can be overcome. Paul continues his list in verse 4. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. From the first, first list we mentioned to these next three, that one kind of reads the other. Obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, they come from these other lifestyles that are mentioned. Now I'm not going to sit down here and, and break down each one of these things that are listed for you. Most of you, I'm sure, when, when they're listed, something comes to mind that we've said, or at least we've thought. If not, you've probably heard it or seen it come from others. Simply, simply watching the television is enough to get an example of any of these if you want to look for it. That's a good indicator of how important these passages are, how pertinent they are for today. For what is reflected on those screens, what we see on, even on the video games, and I'm not bashing the industry as a whole, but that stuff we see is reflecting somebody's heart, a lot of people's hearts. And it's teaching our children to act like the ways of the world, to chase after the ways of the world and reflect the world rather than reflect Jesus Christ. We are becoming products of what we ingest daily. But this doesn't have to be. Because we must look at what each of our individual hearts desires. Is your heart desiring the things of the world or the things of God? From the heart, the mouth speaks. Paul continues in verse 5. For of this you can be sure, nor immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Such a person is an idolater and does not have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Those are hard words. Does not have any inheritance.
inheritance. You think, well, Pastor, that's a little harsh. I mean, people are struggling, people are scared, and you're preaching about things like not having inheritance in the kingdom of God. Yes, I am. Because when we are afraid, when there is a panic, when a lot, a lot of that comes from a deep-rooted question of what if. What if I'm not saved? What, do I really believe in this Jesus? We cannot and we will not have peace until we have addressed that issue of eternal salvation. Because guess what? We all have an eternity. It's a matter of which one we want. Which one we're going to choose. These lifestyles and attitudes that are covered in the scriptures this morning are not for the follower of Christ. These are the very things that we are to turn from. The very things that the Holy Spirit will help us to walk away from. For when we believe and are baptized, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us, the old is washed away and the new is born. Now these can also come from a false sense of security, which has been built up from false teaching and a lack of repentance which stems from the church, as in the body of Christ, not holding itself accountable before one another. Our next scripture is going to address that. Verses 6 and 7 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. But why are we disobedient? Because we've not been taught the truth. Because scriptures like these, the instructions for Christian livings, for Christian households, for marriages, they're not being taught. No one wants to hear what we're not supposed to do if it goes against what we're doing. And preachers don't want to offend anybody. But, and I hate to bring it to those who think that, but, but the word of God might offend many people. In fact, I hope that it does, and that sounds off. But if it offends us, it means we heard it. That we have heard the Spirit of God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and it is not a great, big, happy feeling. It's a prick to the soul that reminds us of the way, of the, the choices we've made, of, of the truths of God's Word. It makes us aware of our transgressions. Not to cast, it doesn't happen to cast us into a depression or into a temper tantrum because we don't want to change, but to change our course. To change our heading and bring us to repentance and, and eventually to thanksgiving because then we're back on the path to his will for us. Back in alignment with his plan. It is not ideal. I thought about this as I was putting this together. It's not ideal that it takes a situation like this to make us think about such things. And hopefully those who read and teach the Word of God are always teaching such things. But unfortunately, when times are good, we tend to teach blessings and abundance rather than repentance and restoration. I say this because, because time is shorter by the day. And God did not create us for a life of luxury or worldly blessings, but a life of service. And at times, persecution and suffering. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun, does it? But that's what it is. And yes, there are blessings in such a life. But there is not a life lived for Christ that is without suffering. However, if we understand what waits for us in eternity, whichever side of eternity we're headed to, a life of service and suffering doesn't sound so unbearable. It sounds a little more doable, doesn't it? I share all this today because our call from Jesus was this. Our calling, our mission was go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you're looking for that, I believe it's Matthew 28. We, the body of Christ, are tasked with drawing others to Jesus Christ. How are we doing this? Is that our prayer? Are we living like those who desire to imitate Christ? What are our everyday prayers? Do they reflect a God-given mission and a drive to reflect Him or a drive to reflect the world? The body of believers has been infected with this idea that of a worldly Christianity, a worldly Christian that seeks worldly things, that, 
that minds their own business and outside of Sunday mornings is just like everybody else. That is why we see those who call themselves Christians living out a lifestyle that we read about in the beginning. Some in secret, some in open. As the scripture said, because these are improper for God's holy people. We must get back to the mission given to us by Christ. Now some know this, and some try. Some realize the importance of this, and they try to implement changes, and try to convict others. There's our, there's our problem. We try to convict others when that's not our job. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. We try to do this with rules, with traditions, and, and we tell others to follow. That's not how it works. We can sit in our pews and think about it all we want, and think about the things being done wrong by others. Or, or we go to another extreme and throw out all the tradition. And we can have a rock concert. We can, we can play music to set the mood, the mood for worship, the mood for giving, the mood for conviction. We, we, we start to manipulate. We can build sets for Sunday morning and sets for our Bible studies to, to, to be aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Because if people don't come, people don't give. And it's a business, right? Wrong. Yep. We see both extremes and everything in between. And at each point, the other cries out blasphemy. But this does not please God. It is not worship. In fact, in many instances, we are grieving the Holy Spirit more than we are worshiping Him. This issue is as old as time itself. I want to read you a teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 1. The heading says, That which defiles... This, like I said, this argument is as old as can be. It says, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders and don't wash their hands before they eat? Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help his father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him. Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Let them, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain this parable to us. Jesus said, are you still so dull? And he asked them, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. They were hung up on the rules. That's all they understood, so that's what they taught. And Christ broke the rules. And yet here we are 2,000 years from now still having the same argument. The do's and don'ts of being a Christian. Of following Jesus Christ. It is what's in our hearts. We have brought up generations preaching that acceptance and tolerance is the way of Christ. We have taught that, or at least ignored the misinterpreted teachings when it says that Christ dined with sinners, that he ate and drank with them and loved them. We now have thousands and maybe even millions of followers who have taken that and turned it into, well, in order to love as Christ did, we just be like the rest of the sinners. After all, Christ, a Christ-like person wouldn't try to offend anyone. That's 
sad in Galilee. Wouldn't try to offend anyone. And out of their hearts come the things of the world. They seek after them. They, they become obsessed with the pleasures and comforts of this world and assume that God is a God that blesses. And if he doesn't bless us, then he must not hear us. That's where we are wrong. He absolutely would offend someone, not out of spite or evil desires, but by speaking truth. You see, those whose hearts have been softened, those who's, who's, who perhaps knew him but have strayed, they accept his truth and they repent. But those whose hearts are hardened like the Pharisees, they lash out. They become offended and they turn from the truth as if it burns their ears, as if it's an affront to their senses. Why did I cover all this today? Why so much? Because we are in a time when we are seeing both sides personified in great numbers. We are seeing greed, lustfulness, covetousness, envy, and downright evil at its best. But we are also seeing the love of Christ, the humanity of Christ come pouring out of his creation. We are seeing young people that want to know the truth. They are recognizing that they have been told what they've been told for years is not quite it, that there's more. <clears throat> but in the middle, there are those who are confused or uneducated or, or maybe just ignorant on the topic in the matter of imitating Christ. Maybe, like I said, maybe due to an ignorance of Scripture, maybe due to a, to a lack of teaching on the part of others. It may not seem like a big deal, but it's a big deal to me as a teacher of the Word. When some have a warped sense of what it is to follow Christ. You see, we are called to do more than just say we believe. We are called to follow him, to imitate. I can't bear the thought of leading somebody astray. The scripture said this morning, no, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. I don't want anyone to feel the wrath of God because I presented the word of God falsely. Or somebody to be disobedient because I have led them in that direction. If the Holy Spirit dwells within us, then there is an inherent desire to mirror Christ. To do right in the sight of God. Will we be perfect at it? By no means. No one is. We will be tempted from every angle and we will fall occasionally. But failure is not a sign that salvation has not been obtained or that we have somehow become unsaved. It simply means we're human beings and that we have given into our sin nature. This will happen. But you have to remember that we are in a war, a war which has already been won because Christ fought the last battle. But we are still in our little battles and our little skirmishes with sin and occasionally we're going to lose. Think of it, all over the world we have these wars. We have these civil wars that break out in countries. And even after it's pretty much decided, you have these little guerrilla groups and these little militias that pop up here and there. They have their little battles, even when the outcome is already known. But they're not going to give up. That's kind of how Satan is. He's not going to give up. He's going to keep fighting. He's going to keep picking. He's going to keep trying to infiltrate and keep trying to disrupt the plan that God has, even knowing he's already lost. And occasionally we're going to lose those little battles. What worries me are not those who fall occasionally, but those who see no wrong in their lifestyle, those who willingly take part in the sins clearly outlined in the scriptures, who say to love Christ is to accept and to partake, and then try to wear the title follower of Christ. If to follow Christ is to imitate him, this lifestyle, these lifestyles could not be farther from the truth, nor could it be any more grieving to the Holy Spirit, who longs to dwell within us and within them, and to save them, if they would only surrender and accept Christ. So what do we do? How do we live? What, what do we change if we are in that category, in any of those? We stop thinking about rules, about only tradition, which in themselves is fine but are in no way a measuring stick of our faithfulness and devotion to Christ. 
we preach and teach the word of God, all of it unapologetically, and we call sin a sin. We hold each other accountable and we help one another to know what the word says so that we can obey and lift one another up. And we do so in love. When we understand the word, when we are convicted, we leave our sinful ways behind us, we separate ourselves from such things, we refuse to take part in that which defiles. You see, we ask people to come into a church building and to partake in our traditions, in our worship, and, and never help them to understand who Christ is. Nor do we mirror him for them. And then they leave because they weren't excited. Or they didn't feel anything because they didn't see or hear Christ. And then we chalk it up to, well, they just weren't ready to receive him. That hurt. That brings me to our final thing to do. Finally, we must imitate Christ. Never did he badger, bully, or put on a show. Instead, he lowered himself. He served everyone before him. He fed the hungry. He prayed for healing. He prayed against demons and diseases. He called out sin when he saw it. Yes, he ate with sinners. Yes, he drank with sinners. He broke traditions. But he did so not to partake but to build a relationship and to gain an opportunity to speak the truth to them. We conveniently leave that out today. All of that is fine, but if the truth isn't spoken, it's all for naught. There is a great difference. Today, the world needs us like no other time to imitate Christ. They, need, they don't need tradition. They don't need pizzazz or condemnation. No, they need to see the light and the love of Christ and to hear the truth of his word spoken authoritatively in love. They need to see that his followers are in fact set apart. Not in the sense that they are physically separated from others, but that they are set apart in attitude, in servitude, in speech, and in love. They need to see that they do this like no other, as if they were doing it for Christ himself. That, my friends, will draw others to Christ. That is what the world and the church need right now. They don't need bickering over whether to live stream or hold service, whether to sing praise songs or to pray. They need to see Jesus. That is how we follow God's example as near to loved children. So we must evaluate our life. Evaluate our living. What and who are we imitating? Because time is short. And while we might have others fooled, the Lord knows our hearts. Do we know our own hearts? Take a long look. Read back on your posts, on your text messages. Even look at your checkbook register. Do they reflect a person imitating Christ? Or a person imitating the Word? For by our fruits we are known. And from the mouth the heart speaks. What does our heart say? Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, as we just said, you know our hearts, each and every one. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, Lord, you know exactly what's in our hearts. You know our temptations, Lord. You know the, the, the struggles we have, the battles we face within, Lord. The temptations we face, you know every bit of it, Lord. But you promised, Lord. That upon accepting you, we are forgiven. Lord, that we are made new in you. Yes, the devil's going to try. He's going to try hard. He's going to try to scare us. Lord, to tempt us, to scare us, to, to get us to submit to the, the sin nature that's within us, Lord. But you have said we are free from that. Help us to be confident in that, Lord. That we are free, that we are saved, that we have an eternity with you. Lord, that we are on the good side of eternity. Help us to know that, Lord, so that we may have peace in you. Because we cannot have peace if we do not know you, if we do not know that our salvation is secure. Lord, so I pray that each one listening would know that they are secure. If they have truly confessed their faith in you, if they have repented, Lord, they are free. And they have been set aside for something far greater than what is here right now. And I praise you for that. I praise you for that truth and that promise, 
Lord, that you have given us. And I thank you.